Hey everyone, welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the podcast. This is number 336. And in just a moment, I'll share an interview I did with Sandy Gibson, who is the co-founder and CEO of Better Place Forests. And we'll talk about why forests are the cemeteries of the future. So before we get started with that, a couple of announcements. I want to thank my latest supporters on Patreon, Louise O'Brien and Daraline C. Shales. Thank you so much for signing up to make monthly or annual contributions that will help keep the podcast on the air. If you're interested in learning more about how to become a supporter, you can go to my page at patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash e-o-l-u. Thanks again to everyone who's been stepping up the last few years in making these small contributions that make a huge difference. And I do want to say we are now just three supporters away from meeting our goal of being able to provide transcripts for every interview going forward in the future. So just three more people signing up and I think we'll be there in a couple of weeks. So thanks again, everyone. And then I wanted to just share a few comments that I've received on some of our past episodes. Uh, M. Sembra wrote on the episode on Swedish death cleaning, our homes are not museums. What, that's a great reminder. Don't waste time treasuring items beyond their material value. So thank you so much for making that comment so true. Uh, we shouldn't be turning our homes into museums. I really like that thought. And next, Jeannie C. wrote about the episode on Death Cafe. I loved this interview and wish I had had it 10 years ago and went on to say that she was inspired to help a senior home start a death cafe, which is wonderful. That's what I was hoping for that episode. So I'm really glad to hear that. And Tatiana wrote, I've been singing the praises of your podcast since I first came across it more than a year ago and mentioned that she learned about the integrative thanatology program at the Open Center in New York City from the podcast and went on to train there. And so once again, that's what I hope for this podcast, that I'll be able to share information with you about all kinds of things that are out there in the world, knowing that not everyone will be interested in everything I bring forward, but hoping that you might hear just the right thing one day that will inspire you to do something in the world to make it a better place as we reach the end of life. So thanks for your comments. And I encourage anyone out there, uh, hit me up. You can write to me through my email address, karen at karenwyattmd.com, or you can go to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, any of those accounts I'm on, you're welcome to message me through there as well. And I'm also always happy to receive your recommendations for interesting people that I should interview. And just this week, I got, um, I've had three more three more recommendations for people to interview, which I'm really excited about. And so you'll be hearing about those interviews in the future a little later this year. So feel free to send me any information you have or make introductions of someone you think I might like to interview. So now we'll move on to the interview with Sandy Gibson. Remember, I'll be back after the interview with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm happy to welcome my guest, Sandy Gibson. Sandy is the co-founder and CEO of Better Place Forests, a sustainable alternative to cemeteries for families who choose cremation. Based in San Francisco, Better Place launched America's first conservation memorial forests in 2017 and has raised more than $55 million in venture capital. Better Place has been featured in the New York Times on the Today Show and by the World Economic Forum. Forum. Sandy headed several companies and worked in finance and software before founding Better Place Forests. And you can learn more about it at the website betterplaceforests.com. So Sandy, thank you for joining me today. Karen, thank you for having me. 
Yeah, I'm really interested to learn more from you about Better Place Forests, but I would love for you to tell us all your personal story before we start, um, because I know that you experienced loss at an early age and how how you navigated that and then how you were inspired to create Better Place Forests. Uh, great. Well, um, yeah, so when I was... Uh, when I was about five, my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh, at the time, it was not Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which they now have a pretty effective treatment for. But at the time, unfortunately, they didn't. Uh, so kind of spent most of my life growing up with my mom in and out of the hospital. Um, and then uh, while my mom was sick, unfortunately, my father had a stroke when I was 10 and died. And then a year later, my mom uh, finally lost that battle with cancer. So uh, ending up working in the kind of funeral and end of life space, uh, kind of made sense just because I spent so much of my life going back to their cemetery and thinking about those moments because something that I think I think we often don't like to think about death and we don't like to think about funerals and and cemeteries. Uh, but one thing that I've realized is that those moments live with you for the rest of your life. You know, you never forget someone dying. You never forget their funeral. You never forget the image of their final resting place. And starting Better Place Forest was very much an effort to see if we could make those better. You know, can we inspire people to plan ahead? Uh, if we can inspire you to choose a final resting place that's beautiful so your family will have that final moment with you and a place to come back to, can we get you to think through what a great funeral will be like? Um, you know, maybe you want more of an after party than a traditional reception. Like, how do we inspire you to think about creating and planning a moment where people can feel connected to you and walk away um, remembering the story of your life in a very happy way? And then last, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to get people to do advanced care directives. Uh, often it's where people want to start, but it's kind of the hardest one to do. Uh, so we tend to like to think, you know, if we can inspire you with something beautiful and positive, maybe you'll start to think to the rest of the plans that you have to do and think about your will and think about your advanced care directive. So you spent time in your younger years, probably far more so than the average teenager being near cemeteries. And did that make you think there has to be something better than this, better than what I see here in front of me? Uh, it certainly did. It, not at the time. Um, you know, the idea for Better Place Forest, and I'll, I'll just for everyone to know, I'll kind of explain what Better Place Forest is and then how the idea came. Uh, so, you know, we're a sustainable alternative to traditional cemeteries, um, specifically focused on families who use cremation. And what we do is instead of a grave and a tombstone, when a family chooses a tree in a better place for us, they're buying a tree dedication. Uh, there's a marker beneath that tree. And that is the place where they spread the ashes of their loved ones. And by choosing that tree, they're contributing to the creation of a conservation memorial area. So it's permanently protected. There's an endowment fund to maintain it in perpetuity. And their family always has a beautiful place in nature to come back to. And if they want to be spread at the same place. Uh, how it works is we're very focused on the baby boomers, uh, about 80% of baby boomers who are planning to choose cremation uh, or expected to choose cremation. Uh, but typically they are not planning ahead and choosing cemeteries. And I think the reason for that is similar to my experience with cemeteries. It's, there are some very beautiful cemeteries. Uh, they tend to be very expensive uh, or very difficult to get spots in. Uh, for many people who are planning on cremation, their starting point is thinking about nature. You know, they, they want to be somewhere beautiful. They want to be somewhere sentimental, meaningful to them. Uh, that doesn't mean that people don't need ritual. And it doesn't mean they don't want a place their family can go back to. It just means that when they think about what they want, that beauty and nature and being a part of nature is the most important thing. So the idea for Better Place Forest is to really blend those two ideas. How do you create a permanently protected space? But how do you also ensure that space is natural and beautiful and a place people want to be in? And the idea specifically for it uh, largely came out of my business experience before. I really used, I used to run a software company for about seven years and, and I didn't love it. It wasn't, you know, it, running a company and building a company and, you know, acquiring customers and, and all of that's very professionally exciting and fun, but I really wanted to be working on something that I thought really mattered. And I loved the idea of creating a business where the product itself was good for the world. Uh, you know, sometimes they talk about triple bottom lines, environmental, social, and financial. And uh, I love that idea. And my business partner had sent me an idea of, uh, you know, trees instead of tombstones, biodegradable caskets and urns and, and things that could be done. And I remember responding to him and saying, well, that's all great, but where do you put them? 
You know, it's easy to think I'd like to be a tree in my backyard. It's difficult to ensure that your family property stays in your family forever. You know, if my father could have been buried at our cottage, he probably would have chosen that. Uh, but he, I don't think that would have been great when a year later we had to sell it after my mom died. Uh, so, you know, I'd kind of responded cynically to that and just said, yeah, beautiful idea, not practical. A couple of days later, it was my mom's birthday. And I was at my mom's, at my parents' grave for her birthday 20 years after she died. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a crowded cemetery in downtown Toronto. It's not beautiful. Um, it's historic, but it's, it's just not necessarily the place I want to go and visit. And in this, the plot we got is right beside the street. And so, you know, you're standing there and you're hearing the cars and it's a shiny black granite tombstone. So you can see the cars behind you reflected in the tombstone. And I remember being there and just being like, God, I don't like this place. And then the bus stop that they put in in Toronto right by it, you know, the, the air brakes of a bus, just that loud screeching sound. And I'm like, God, there's got to be a better place than this. And that was the origins of the name Better Place and, and the idea for Better Place. I walked out of the cemetery, called up my business partner, uh, Brad Milner, our co-founder and COO at Better Place Forest and said, I, I got an idea. And uh, we're going to do the tree thing, but we're going to we're going to own the land and, and create these beautiful places. Hmm. I, I love that idea. And I like that you emphasized the importance of having a place, just a place associated with your loved one. Because I know my parents both chose traditional burial and they're in a veterans cemetery, but still the place that I identify for them is important to me that I visualize their headstones and I visualize where they are. Not that that would be my first choice for where they are, because I love this idea of having the place I visualize be a tree. But I think it is important for us to be able to have a physical place that we associate with our loved ones in our memories. It's the way that I, I like to say it is it's, it's the end of your life story. Uh, you know, I often ask employees when they join Better Place and I say, I, I go from the negative and I actually ask, I say, well, if, if you were to know that your ashes would be in the closet of your spouse or a sibling or, or a child five years after you died, they're still in the closet. Why would that bother you? And what's interesting that you hear is um, occasionally people answer, well, I really feel I should be in nature. Um, but often the answer, you know, just from a hierarchy of, you know, practical problems, often the answer is, oh, well, that'd be really tough on my family. You know, they'd always be wondering, what do I do with these? And knowing that they have to do something. And I, I think that's important because I think where that comes from is the knowledge that, you know, the body has to return to the earth. You know, it's going to be returned to a final resting place somewhere. And for some people, that can be a columbarium niche in a cemetery. Uh, but for people who choose cremation, generally, you know, the words and um, you know, traditions like the words ashes to ashes, dust to dust, earth to earth, uh, I think are still very much programmed in people's minds. And I think it's because there's a natural desire for the body to return to the earth. And, you know, even Marcus Aurelius talked about this back in, I don't know, when he was alive, two or 300 AD, uh, just the idea that our body is from the earth and should go back to the earth. And so I think there's this desire for people to want a final resting place, to know that it's the end of our journey. And the question is, how do you make sure that your family knows it's the one that you wanted and how do you choose one that you think is good and lives up to your life? Hmm. I really like that idea. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about why it's really important right now on our planet that we reimagine cemeteries and that perhaps we can't sustain old traditional cemeteries anymore in, in most of the places where we live. And what are your thoughts on that? So, you know, part of the idea behind Better Place for us was the question of, you know, what is wrong with the existing industry? Um, you know, what makes it difficult to be a business in the existing industry? And it tends to be when you're trying to start something new, it's really important that there is a wave of change. And in this case, I think that wave of change is cremation. And part of what's driving that, when you ask people and you pull them, like, why do they want to choose cremation? One of the most popular answers is to take up less space. I think that comes from the fact that people recognize that um, the modern North American cemetery really came into being, and they built a lot of them in the 50s, when land was very plentiful. 
And now land is very, very expensive and it's not plentiful. So the idea of taking a piece of kind of priority urban land, uh, particularly in places where we're having a housing crisis, and creating a new cemetery is really tough. You know, it's just that that is a lot of land. It's permanently protected. It's not used for other reasons. Uh, the early ideas, you know, Frederick Olmsted was uh, the designer of uh, Central Park in New York. He also uh, made much of his uh, business building cemeteries. And a lot of those early cemeteries were more like parks and they were designed to be places for a community. But with the modern cemetery tradition, where there's a very dense level of, of cemetery plots, you know, it's not double use space. It's not like those cemeteries are designed for the purpose of being a park and being a final resting place. So I think it's just tough when you have limited land to be able to continue that tradition. Um, at the same time, I don't think that means that people don't need final resting places and don't need ritual for their families. I think that's still very, very important. So better places is an attempt to bridge that gap, to create these permanently protected spaces, but in a way that they add back to the world. And second, to ensure that you still have a family place. I really love the vision of that. And I love being, I love being able to pick out a tree and knowing that I will nourish that tree one day and that it becomes a place my family can return to and can kind of make their own and hold their own rituals and picnics and ceremonies, whatever they want to do at that place. I think it's, that's a, a really important part of it is when you just think about family and their needs in the future. And then I think there's an interesting part of it that isn't always intuitive. And it's just, to me, when I think of my mom, I see her final resting place. I just don't think it's easy to forget that. Um, and I know that final resting place and that final moment, you know, the last time I saw what was close to my mother was, would have been her casket in the, in the grave. And, you know, it's very rare that they actually fill in a grave while you're there. So that last image is this open grave. And to me, that's just not, it's not, a, it's not closure. It's not a beautiful image to me. Um, I would much prefer to have the image of a beautiful forest, of a beautiful tree, of life and thriving and leaves growing and oxygen being created. You know, those are all things that speak to me. Uh, and so by choosing a tree, people have that option of creating that memory for their family. So would you walk me through it? Say, if I have, I guess I would... I would visit one of your forests, whether virtually or in person, and pick out a tree that's available in advance. Um, and then at the time of need, uh, well, tell me how it works. <laughs> my right. family would bring my so, ashes. There's two, different, there's two different groups of customers. There's customers who are buying at need. Uh, someone has passed away, and they are choosing a tree for that person who has passed away. And that typically will be the family calling us. They'll either choose that tree online or they'll come to a forest and pick out a tree in person. And then we'll host their spreading ceremony. And that spreading ceremony is the preparation of the ashes. Uh, we remove soil from beneath the tree. We um, prepare the soil so it can very easily be mixed with the ash. Uh, and then we perform a spreading ceremony where we spread the ashes back beneath the tree so that you can't see the ashes anymore but also so that the ratio of ash to soil and moisture is correct because it's the bacteria in the soil that actually break down that bone ash and turn it into the calcium and phosphorus and potassium that are the nutrients for the tree itself. Um, and that's just a beautiful, simple ceremony, similar to a grave, graveside service. Uh, there might be readings, there might be prayers, uh, there might be poems, there might be nothing. It really depends on what someone wanted. Um, and it's about creating that moment for them. For other customers who are choosing in advance, and that's the majority of our customers, uh, they're coming to the forest, uh, they're doing an online forest tour to discover the different sections of the forest, determine what speaks to them. And then they're coming to the forest so they can come visit and pick out their tree. And why that's a little bit different, I love it, is that when someone comes and picks their tree, uh, we always capture photos of that person. And there's a lot of software that goes behind Better Place Forests in terms of how you mark and tag all the trees, how you keep track of them, how you associate things like visits and visitor records and photographs with that tree. And what's really neat about it is that when you pick your tree, almost everyone's smiling and happy and it's a beautiful moment. And those photos are kept there. So I remember our very first customer, 
when he passed away and his family came for the spreading ceremony, they got to see a picture of their father, who is kind of a stern lawyer. He, he had a great sense of humor. But, you know, he's just this you know, very kind of stoic, professional guy with a bit of a fun streak. And they get to see a picture before the spreading ceremony of their father standing at that tree with a big smile on his face. And I love that because for the rest of their lives, they know he's in his happy place. They know that this is a place that he chose, that he wanted to be, and that he's waiting there for his wife. And if his kids want to join him, them as well. And I just think that's a really beautiful idea to get to think about when you think about someone you loved and who's passed away. And it seems to me that would be really helpful to the family with their grief to know that they carried out their father's wishes and they were kind of fulfilling a dream of their father's by by making sure his ashes made it there where he wanted them to be. And I think that that it sounds like just a lovely ceremony, but also a memory that they will cherish. It's so important if people can to think ahead and tell families what they want to do. Because again, it's, it's tough. It's actually one of the number one areas for family strife is fighting over funerals. Um, you know, someone might have more resources and want to do a very expensive funeral. Someone might have less and they don't want to, they don't want to pay as much, but they feel bad about not wanting to pay as much, so on and so on. But you really see the fights around when people have differing opinions on what someone would have wanted. And that's tough. I remember speaking to a woman once who her sister hasn't talked to her in five years because she gave the eulogy at the funeral and her sister believed she should have given the eulogy. And that's mm. tough. That's just unfortunate uh, because it doesn't need to be that way. We can think through these things and we can, we can, hopefully we can encourage people to do it, but people can leave a little bit more of a clear plan. And again, part of that is trying to limit pain. You're giving people a ritual to try and move on. And there's a great, uh, you know, the view of why is ritual important. I was just on a, on a podcast talking about gratitude. And there's an interesting idea there. Gratitude is a concept of how do you find gratitude in something very bad or hard that happened to you? You know, it's how do you, and it's part of the process of creating post-traumatic growth. And I think when you look at ritual and a lot of rituals, they're designed in that way as well. They're designed to help celebrate someone's life to remind you that they've returned back to a cycle of life. Uh, if you're religious and you're part of a religious ceremony, to remind you to learn that this person has gone back to God. You know, all of these things I think are really important because they help people move on. Um, on the positive side, people, if they plan in advance, can also come up with kind of fun, beautiful ways of making someone who loves them life richer. You know, that photo that you have standing there hugging your tree is a beautiful thing for someone to look at and smile and think they're in their happy place. That makes me feel good. Um, other folks, we've uh, helped talk through the idea of thinking through their after party. And I think that's really fun because I love it when someone has thought about what their favorite cocktail is, that they want everyone to gather together and drink and remember them. And for the rest of their lives, if you know that your father's favorite drink was an old fashioned with you know an extra cherry, you can drink that and feel connected to them. And that connection, I think, is something that we always need for the rest of our lives. You're so right about that. And I, I like the idea that you can be totally free and spontaneous in planning this after party or memorial service. It sounds like when you're out in nature and next to the tree, because you're not in a physical structure that might have rules and limitations around what you can do. There's, you know, there's so many parts that when people think in advance, and I've seen our customers get so creative, you know, it often, the first thing that's easy to think about is, do I want a tree or not? And if the answer is yes, great, choose a tree with us. And then think, what else do you want? And I remember helping one customer with her plan and she wanted to set aside funds to pay for her family to rent a few houses up in Sea Ranch. And Sea Ranch is near a forest in Mendocino. It's beautiful, it's architecturally stunning. It's this very beautiful project from the 70s and 80s. And for her, those were her happiest moments, was being on vacation up at Sea Ranch. And so I just, seeing the smile on her face as she was thinking through, she's like, yeah, I want a three-day weekend. I want to pay for two houses. I want them to stay together. Here's where I want them to go for dinner on the first night. Here's what I want them to do on the second. I want, you know, I'm a morning person. I want them to come in the morning, have some coffee and tea and some, there's a delicious bakery up in, in Point Arena where our forest is. 
and she wants them to have their treats and, and then and then spread her ashes and feel free. And then like this whole weekend was a goodbye. And I just, I fall in love with that idea because I think of the people who will one day attend that and that they're gonna go to something that's really special, really unique, that someone loved you so much that they planned ahead to think about this entire goodbye experience even after they're gone. And that's the kind of memory that you'll have for the rest of your life. Wow, I love that. And to think that you could leave behind like this very special surprise for your loved ones after you're gone, like you're, you're entertaining them, you're nourishing them and giving them this way to come together after you're gone. And it's, it could be, it could be just a surprise, something they weren't expecting at all, but what a sweet gift to leave. It's, it's, and it's a way to kind of reach back out and feel like, and to know also that even after your death, you'll still have an impact in their lives. I think there's so many things that can be healthy and healing about thinking about this. It's scary. You have to think about death, but when you break it down into smaller, more fun questions, uh, I think you can, you can help that process. I had another customer and guys always say this, uh, I don't want to be overly, you know, trite and say guys and girls think different things, but uh, very frequently when I'm helping a customer with this sort of thing, the guys will say whatever they want. I don't, I don't care. It's not about me. It's whatever they want. I don't, I don't care. And I always say that's, that's not going to work because they want what you wanted. They are looking in that moment of grief to feel connected to you. And they really want to do something that you wanted them to do. They want you to give them a bit of a mission. Um, so, you know, I'm talking to one guy. I said, so let's just do something basic. What's your favorite food? And he goes, ah, oh, well, that'd be Costco. He's from New York. He's like, that'd be Costco pizza. Only decent New York style pizza you can get outside in California. <laughs> and I was like, okay, all right. So not the answer I was expecting, but let's go with it. <laughs> so it's Costco pizza. What do you want on it? He's like, well, it's got to be cheese. And his wife pipes and goes, my kids don't like eating cheese pizza. He's like, I'm okay with pepperoni or all dressed. So, you know, now we know it's, it's three pizzas. Um, and I say, great. What do you like? What's your favorite drink? He's like, I'm not a big drinker. I'm like, well, then what do you drink? He's like, oh, Bud Light. I'm like, you always drink Bud Light. He goes, yeah, that's my drink. I said, great. And his, of course, his wife chimes and says, my kids are not going to have to drink Bud Light at your funeral. And they, you know, go back and forth and they're like, okay, half Bud Light and half whatever they want. <laughs> but what's so fun about this is you're thinking about this and the guy's smiling by the end of this and he's a, he's a real character. And he's thinking, you know, it's kind of fun to think that like when I die, my family's going to get together in my condo and they're going to eat my favorite pizza and they're going to drink Bud Lights. And I said, yeah, isn't it? Isn't that kind of fun? And it's good for them too, because it's good to feel there. And part of where that came from, my uncle, he would had prostate cancer for like 12 years. Uh, my mom had died when he was around, I don't know, 50 or 55. So he'd seen death close, close hand. He knew that funerals are important. These things are important. And he got to plan ahead. The best part of it, the most special part of it, he had the full casket and the big church ceremony and the big reception at the golf club and all that stuff. Uh, but the part that I will never forget that I loved was he wanted something very specific. He wanted a very small wake. He wanted his body there at home and he wanted his six kids, me and my brother. And he wanted uh, a couple of our cousins to be there together, drinking his favorite beers, wines, and whiskeys and eating his two favorite cheeses of Stilton and Yarlsberg. Because that's, those are the moments that mattered to him in his life. And I just, the idea of being there and A, I think Yarlsberg is a delicious cheese. Um, B, he did not have good taste in beer. So, you know, I'm not sure I needed to be drinking Molson Export at my uncle's funeral, but, uh, but you know, it did make me feel connected to him. And it was funny, right? Because you're doing this thing that he wants and telling his favorite jokes, none of which I can repeat on a podcast. Um, but it was very special because it was him. And I knew in that moment that I was doing something that he wanted me to do and it was always going to be his. And the rest of my life, I eat Jarlsberg, I think of I think of Uncle Murray. And I just, I think there's a beauty to that. I think we could all do something as simple because that event, I don't know, what is that, a couple hundred bucks? You know, and I had a customer do something even simpler. She wanted a, she was deeply Catholic. She specifically didn't want a, a funeral. And I talked her through, you know, what do you, if you don't want a funeral, then, you know, funeral homes will help you with that, folk, with that stuff. Well, what do you want with us? She said, well, I want my family to gather together in my favorite park before they go and spread my ashes. And I want a barbecue. I said, okay, well, what do you want at the barbecue? And she's lists off her favorite, favorite foods and everything's quite simple. And I'm like, what do you, what do you want for drinks? She's like, that'd be tequila. I like margaritas. 
And I think you should invite my priest and my two favorite nuns. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, this is beautiful. This is, it's her. It's her way of doing things. And that's what I think is special because everyone can do that. It's not expensive. And it will relieve so much of the pain in the world, but also create hope and beauty in a moment where people really need it. Oh, I love that. And it sounds like, well, I know that you have, the, from looking at your website, you encourage everyone to create these plans, but it sounds like you can get involved and assist when they're making the plans. Uh, you know, we're always here. We have advisors. Uh, our focus is, is final resting places and conservation memorial forests. Uh, we often help connect our customers to funeral homes uh, so that they can get the support of a funeral director where they need. But often what we're hearing are questions that people have that are outside of a traditional funeral that are, how do I create my celebration of life or how do I think through my after parties? So, you know, all of our, our folks on our advisor team, uh, their primary focus is in theory to help, help you identify if a tree is right for you and where the right tree is for you. But really, these are, these are folks who are always talking uh, to our customers and helping them through questions. And, and they've heard a lot and they've talked a lot. And, uh, you know, we're always here to help and, and support customers how they need. And then do you have staff people that are present during the um, placement of the ashes who come and assist the family? Absolutely. We help with the whole process of how to prepare the ashes, how to help them think through what kind of celebration of life they want. Uh, often... Uh, our customers will come with, if they want a religious ceremony with a religious figure, uh, if they've worked very closely with a funeral director, sometimes that funeral director will come as well and support through the whole process. We're really flexible to help people with what they want in their way. Uh, so, you know, I think about it like my, my parents, my parents both had very, uh, you know, traditional, big, fancy funerals. And in, in their case, it was great because the funeral directors were able to help with the entire process. Uh, many of our customers uh, they're not thinking about a traditional funeral, so they might not be dealing with a funeral home. And they still want some support in terms of knowing who should they call for a cremation? Uh, how should they think about something for their family? Uh, we've had families who, you know, I hear this fairly often, where people don't want any form of traditional, what they see as a traditional funeral. They really just want their family to get together at their house. They want people to get together. Uh, there was one that was beautiful that I loved. And I said, well, what do you want? And how many people do you want there? She says, we talked through it. She said, I just want my family. I said, great. And what do you want them to do? And she said, I want them to tell these stories. What else do you want? She said, and I, you know, I asked her, what about your favorite, favorite drinks or favorite wine? She goes, oh, I want a case. And she was very specific about the wine that she liked. Um, and so for her, it was just get a case of wine, have 18 of her friends and family there, tell her favorite stories and, and have you know, a yellow rose for each person who's there that they can bring to the forest for the spreading ceremony the next day. You know, it's, it's that flexibility of something that's helping people find what speaks to them because that moment is the goodbye that their family wants. That's the ritual that their family needs. Oh, I have to say this is, this sounds so satisfying to me because I'm a planner and I love, I've always loved planning different types of parties and events. And so this is right up my alley to be able to make these plans for myself and create this amazing time that my family and friends could experience even after I'm gone. It's, you know, it's pretty fun when you open up the planning doors because some people, they just say, I really want something simple. And other people, uh, you know, our, our general counsel at Better Place Forest is a real character, uh, incredibly smart, grew up in Louisiana, worked for Obama, uh, just has this great career, incredibly interesting. And I get answers I didn't expect. And I go, you know, Nundi, what, um, what, do you wanna, what do you want people to drink? And he looks at me and he goes, well, there's got to be a brown cocktail and a, and a clear cocktail. So for the brown cocktail, I'd probably say a, a Manhattan. And for the clear cocktail, let's think something gin-based, maybe a little bit. And it was just so funny to realize that he had thought through this in quite a bit of detail, but really knew it. And listening, I'm like, well, what wine do you want to serve? He's like, that'd be a left bank Bordeaux. And I just loved the idea of the fact that he knows, and there's going to be this event one day that is so him. And for me, it's the same thing. My favorite, uh, you know, my favorite drink or my go-to drink is probably a, a bullet bourbon, old fashioned, light on the sugar, heavy on the cherries. Uh, but my favorite drink in the world is a Florida Canyon rum. 
And I just, it's fun to me to know that people can, can go and have that drink. Um, and for the rest of their life, they can always find that same drink and drink it and think, ah, this was Sandy's favorite drink. Yeah, that's so special. Uh, I have a couple of technical questions I, I just wanted to ask you, because this is for sure. mostly for myself, because I live in a state that doesn't have a better place forest. Is, can I pick a tree in a different state and can my family bring my ashes anywhere? I don't even know about that, if there's any laws about transporting. So, you know, you can, uh, the only group that can ship ashes in the U.S. Uh, without your family present is the USPS. Uh, so that is U.S. Postal Service. Uh, it's very straightforward. They have a standard deal across the country uh, for how they handle ashes. Um, if your family wants to bring their ashes, of course they can do that. They bring them on the plane. I recommend keeping them in carry-on just in case you lose your bags. And you can bring those ashes to a forest. We have many customers in California, for example, who are from different states because, you know, being a redwood and overlooking the Pacific Ocean is so meaningful to them. Mm. Or because maybe they loved California, but they moved away. Oh, so those are all different things that we see. Uh, also, I always encourage people, if they know they love Better Place Forests, but we're not in their region yet, to still sign up on our website so that they can let us know. Uh, you know, the, the best way for us to know that we should be in Colorado is that we have lots of people from Colorado on our mailing list saying, hey, when are you coming to Colorado? Uh, there's nothing that puts a fire under our, our real estate team's butt, like customer emails saying, hey, this is what I want. When are you going to help me with this? Uh, because it's, it's interesting when you ask the people who work at Better Place Forests why they work here. It's it usually started with something like I love nature and I want to protect it. And fairly quickly, people realize that's incredibly important. But the most inspiring thing in the world is a family saying thank you. Yeah, definitely. And I was interested, Sandy, because you mentioned about mixing the ash and the soil in just the right quantities. And that made me think that when people scatter their loved one's ashes in various places, they might imagine that those ashes are contributing to the growth of a, a forest or a garden or something, but maybe they're missing some of the scientific information they should have about putting the ash in properly in the right place. Well, I'm, I'm happy to answer, answer that. So there are a lot of kind of rumors and I would, I would say some misinformation around ashes. So, in general, ashes are the small bone fragments that have been treated at extreme heat. In the case of water cremation, they're bone fragments that have been treated uh, through a process of using alkaline hydrolysis, which is a lye uh, base to remove the rest of the organic matter. Um, so you're really dealing with small pieces of bone. Um, there's a few reasons this is important. I'll get somewhat graphic. And I apologize to anyone who's uh, bothered by that. But, you know, they're small bone fragments. Uh, sometimes those are pulverized by law. Sometimes they're not. Um, if they're not pulverized, then you actually often will see recognizable bone fragments in that mix. Now, that mix by itself does not add anything to nature. However, it is just bone fragments. So they do break down over time. And the, what causes that breakdown, again, is the natural bacteria in the soil. So the challenge with ashes, if you spread ashes over a large enough area, eventually it will break down and break down into soil and nutrients. Where some of the problem people have had and you might have heard about is someone planting a tree over ashes or burying an urn with ashes in them. That's a very concentrated clump of, you know, highly alkaline bone ash. And that by itself is going to take a long time for nature to slowly break down layer after layer of that concentrated bone ash. So if the goal is to return to nature, you really want to ensure that that is mixed properly um, and that, you know, that mixed mixture amount is going to change a bit. We have uh, botanists and hydrologists in each forest look at this to give us the right ratio based on the acidity of the soil so that it's that process. Half of that is important because it's about ensuring that the ashes will integrate into the soil quickly. The other aspect of that that's important is many people struggle with the, the visual experience of seeing ash or feeling it or touching it. Um, it's, a, it's, a very in, you know, it's a very intense experience. Some people, totally fine. Other people, it's just not something they want to do. Uh, so it's important to know when you're dealing with family, if you are doing a spreading on your own, who's doing it, how are they preparing those ashes? And the one, and this is going to be very specific, uh, but can be very difficult for people, 
it's really hard to get the bone ash out of the corners of the plastic bag that the ashes are usually placed in. So if you are doing it on your own, it's really important to remember to bring water with you because you want to rinse out that bag because throwing a, a plastic ash bag away with a little piece of someone you love to be totally graphic, it, it, it is not, it's not a good experience. Um, that's obviously something that makes people very uncomfortable. So there are some process things that people should think through whether they choose someone like better place for us to do this on their own. It just, it is important to think through that process and make it a beautiful experience. I get too many customers who've, who've had bad experiences. And again, it's, it's not something you get a redo on. There's no take backs. So it's something that you do really want to do well. The joke I'll say on it is I talk to often guys will say this and they say, I don't care. I can spread ashes in the woods for free on my own. And the answer I'll ask and say, well, that, that's nice, but most likely you're the ashes. So if you talk to your wife and kids and see if they want to spread your ashes in the woods that way. And that's an important one because, again, you just need to know who's going to be doing it and how comfortable they are with that kind of thing. Some people are very comfortable with it. Other people, it's the, the visual aspect is or the feeling of ash is something that makes them very uncomfortable. That's interesting. And that makes me uh, want to ask the question, is it only ashes from fire cremation that are allowed or what about people who've used aquamation or human composting of the remains can those be placed in a better place forest so we support all forms of uh, disposition in philosophically uh, you know believe if someone wants natural burial that's a beautiful option we don't do natural burials in our forests I've, I've dealt with some frustrated folks who really really want a natural burial there's just no way that we could get at, get a, a body under a, an existing redwood tree in a way that wouldn't hurt the tree and in a way that was cost effective to the point that someone could afford it. It would be very, very expensive to do it otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, so we typically focus on cremation. Uh, in most of our sites, we allow water cremation. We're working on allowing it everywhere. The cemetery and funeral industry is very regulated and very complex. So it really depends on the state and local level regulations as to how they have defined Ashes coming from alkaline hydrolysis, sometimes they're defined the same way as uh, fire cremation. Other times they're not. So it's, it can be a fair amount of work. Uh, but very much something we believe in, uh, really support recomposition. I think it is a great idea for people to have that as an option. Uh, it's not available in very many places, uh, but it is something that we're working on updating all of our permits for so that we can allow it if that's what someone wants. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, you know, we do plant impact trees whenever someone chooses a tree those more than offset the carbon emissions from traditional cremation. Uh, but, you know, if someone wants a slightly lower environmental load, then water cremation is a great option. You know, Desmond Tutu just chose that. Beautiful option. It's something that speaks to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people fire is something that's not something they love. And the, the concept of water is very comforting. For other people, uh, they like the cleansing concept of fire and the com completion and the fact that the rest of their matter will go into the air. I kind of view this as kind of a no judgment place. It's, it's up to you what you want. We make sure it's carbon neutral no matter what. And we support families choosing what they like. Uh, so that's really good to hear, planting the impact trees, because that is a concern I've had about fire cremation. So it's nice to know that you're able to offset that. Yeah, impact trees are, I'm going to say a funny concept. It's not the right word. They're interesting because they can take a little explaining. We buy forests that are in really beautiful, really iconic locations. And that land is typically quite expensive. Uh, our smallest forest is about 40 acres and our largest is a few hundred. So that land is very, very expensive. We also know that for our customers, they really want to have the maximum impact on the environment. And so what we did was we came up with this idea of impact trees where we would partner with groups like One Tree Planted and we plant those trees in drought and fire affected areas of the US. So mostly focused on reforestation efforts. And the reason for that is that, you know, we have some customers who come and they say they want absolute maximum environmental impact. And that, for example, in California would probably be a redwood forest in very Northeastern California. Uh, and the reason it would have more impact is because the land's super cheap. So the price for their tree would go towards purchasing more acreage. The catch is, it's very, very rare that someone actually wants to be eight or nine or 10 hours away. Uh, so it's hard to find enough people who really want that. One day I suspect we might do it, but most of our customers want something that's accessible. They want their family to come visit. 
They want it to be a beautiful place that they feel connected to, and they want to maximize their environmental impact. So that's why we did this partnership so that we can maximize the environmental impact in terms of climate, in terms of protecting and conserving land by focusing on these, you know, far off reforestation projects. And then we focus our experience on these really, really beautiful, iconic properties. Well, it's interesting. I have a friend who owns some land and uh, her dream would be to turn that land into some sort of a burial ground. And I think a better place, better place for us would be perfectly with, match with what she has in mind. She would love to donate land to someone who would turn it into some sort of a burial ground. And I don't, is that ever possible? What I could say about this is that we, all of our landowners, many of them come to us. Uh, so they've heard about Better Place Forest and they've said, I want to protect my land. How can we do this? And what's exciting about it is we buy that land at fair market value, uh, which allows us to protect properties that often are too expensive for land trusts to purchase. And we also know that when the landowner cares this much about a property, they've taken care of that property. They've focused on the permanent preservation of that property and, and making sure it's a healthy forest or it's beautiful and ready to be protected. But uh, we love talking to landowners who want to protect their land because we hear about it all the time. It's just, this is a beautiful way to ensure that if you know finances are important, that a family can still sell their property for, uh, for money for their family. But at the same time, they can know that it will always be protected. Very interesting. Well, Sandy, I, I want to ask you another question that's kind of beyond talking about the forests, but knowing and, and having listened to a few other of your interviews on other podcasts and knowing that you've spent much of your life personally dealing with loss and grief, I just wanted to tap a little bit into your wisdom and any advice that you might have for other people who are experiencing loss right now, because I know there are a lot of people right now at this time in 2022 who are going through loss. And I just wonder if, if you have any bits of wisdom that you would share. Uh, well, well, thank you. I'd, I'd be happy to. The, the, there's a couple stories that I think are important. Um, and I was just on a podcast where someone talked about it in, in gratitude. And how do you find the gratitude for the bad things that have happened to you? And I'd never used those words. I never would have thought about it that way. Uh, but it is very, very interesting to think about it that way. And, and what he meant by that was to say, let's take my parents' dying. What did I learn from that experience that matters in my life? And I can say, uh, I certainly came out of that with a big focus on being focused, uh, knowing that I wanted to achieve something in life and, and doing it and focusing on that, as opposed to you know, hoping that some opportunity comes up as I go through life because, you know, watching my mom die so young, I knew that you have to be quite focused because you might not have 70 years to do, to have your impact on the earth. Uh, so, you know, you can suddenly look at something really bad and say, well, that's a, probably pretty helpful uh, knowing from the age of 12 that like, it's important to find a purpose. Uh, another way to think about it is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, Viktor Frankl uh, was a a psychiatrist in Vienna in the 1930s. And he believed he had developed the new, uh, the, the third Viennese school of psychotherapy after Freud, Jung, and Adler. And uh, I'm not 100% sure it was Adler and Jung who were considered the second school, but I'm going to go with, I think it probably was. And he believed he'd come up with this new theory called logotherapy, meaning therapy, that was really, really important. And the problem was, it was, you know, 1937 or 38, and he was Jewish. Uh, so, you know, he'd heard about the Jews getting rounded up and, and sent away. Uh, and his wife sewed the manuscript to his new treatise on logotherapy into his jacket. And they were both sent to Auschwitz. And his wife died fairly quickly and he survived. And he, he writes about this in Man's Search for Meaning. It's his, his memoir of surviving the Holocaust. And it's this devastating story, but it's, in, it's I strongly encourage everyone to read it. It is incredibly beautiful, incredibly well-written and really meaningful when you ask your question, you know, how do you go through bad things and how do you find something from it? And his basis for logotherapy was this. He said, when he saw people who were surviving on a razor's edge, if they lost their need, their, their, their meaning, their reason to survive, they typically died very quickly. Uh, he saw some people who survived because there was something that they did in their life that they were willing to live for. Someone might say, I love to fish and I will live to fish again. Other people 
the thing that they lived for, the meaning for them was experience, the truest experience of which is love. And they lived to see their family again, to know, to feel the experience of loving a child or a wife again, or a parent. And the other thing that he comments on is he said, he's always been amazed in his life how strong some people are who've gone through some of the most terrible experiences. And what he believed the cause of that was that if someone can find meaning in unavoidable suffering, it can be very powerful. And that's a different way of seeing that similar question. How do you find that terrible thing that happened? How do you find the good that came out of it? And how are you thankful for the good that came out of it? That's a way to come to terms with something bad. Um, and I think when you think about death and life, you know, you want to think about um, two things. First, well, there's two quotes here that I think are interesting of how do you how do you get through pain like death? One is a quote that I heard. I wish I could know who to attribute to, but it was that people don't die to go away forever. They die so that they can always be with you. And I think that's a very, very interesting idea. Um, I certainly know in my experience, uh, the feeling, those moments when you wish they were with you the most, and you've got that very intense emotion, the one that you can feel in your eyes. I think that's because I, I'm religious personally. I feel that is the moment when people are with you. Um, and that's, that's part of it. So I think that's an important way to think about it is that death isn't necessarily an ending. Um, and whether you believe in that at a spiritual level or a genuine religious level, or simply in the idea that people live on in your heart and your mind, I think that's a, those are important ideas to get through that. The second one is a quote that I heard that at the end of all of our lives, we're asked two questions. What did you learn and how much did you love? And I think I've never heard a better question for the purpose of life. I think that is very close to, to me, what it probably means. Um, you know, what did you learn explains a lot of why hardship exists. And when you think about hardship like death, it certainly does remind you how much you love someone. You know, Queen Elizabeth said after Princess Diana died that grief is the high price we pay for love. And I think that when you think about all of those ideas together, I think you can realize that, you know, death is painful, death is hard, death is sad. But it is also I think, a truly human moment that connects you to someone for the rest of your life. That's really beautiful. Really well said, Sandy. And I, I agree with that so much. And I would say Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is, is one of my all-time favorite books that really changed my life by just reminding me that the meaning is what sustains us and we create the meaning. We, it's our job to find the meaning in, in life, whatever it brings to us. We're the ones, that's our work to do. As, as Viktor Frankl said in his second book, Man's uh, Unheard Cry for Meaning, people always ask, what is the meaning of life? And they should be asking, what is my life's meaning? And it's, I think that's kind of it. It's like the only way you know it. And I'll tell you the last story before we go. You know, my mom asked this. She was diagnosed with cancer. She's 39. She's got a five-year-old and an eight-year-old. It's terminal. She got it on Christmas Eve. Um, and years before, she'd been hit by a drunk driver on Christmas Eve. So Christmas, Christmas Eve was not always the best night for my mother. Um, but she was a very positive person and very strong. And she always asked the question, like, why did God do this to me? And one day while she was going through treatment, she had this idea to start a nonprofit called Wellspring where cancer uh, survivors would provide counseling and support to cancer patients. And the idea came from the fact that, you know, she had the fancy psychologist and psychiatrist to tell her questions. And she, she asked this one question, how do I tell my kids? And one psychiatrist said, oh, simple, you don't. And the other one said, of course you do. You have to tell them. So she's sitting there going, well, okay, two experts, two totally different answers. What do I do here? I don't trust either. Um, but she did trust the volunteer who was a cancer survivor who talked to her. And that's where she got the idea for Wellspring. And so Wellspring is now a network of cancer support centers across Canada where cancer survivors provide counseling and support to cancer patients. And the origin of that idea, again, comes from that question of why did this happen to me? You know, in her case, my mom was very religious. Why did God do this to me? Um, and anyone can ask the question in whatever way they want. But when you ask that enough, eventually you will find a reason for it. And that the key is to find that positive reason and the way to take that, that pain and turn it into something good in the world. I think that's, that's part of that question of how much did you learn? Because I kind of think that's the point of life. So true. And uh, Sandy, I, 
I was right to ask you that question because you do have a lot of wisdom and you've, you've gained that through your own pain and challenge through your life. And I can see how it ties right into your vision for better place forests and uh, you're creating your own meaning every day through this work you're doing. Uh, well, thank you. It, that's very much has been the experience uh, is it, better place for us has been an incredible journey. It's amazing to help so many thousands of families. It's amazing to see your team grow and how much it means for people to work a better place for us and be part of the team and work with the families we work with. And personally, it is a journey. And it's, I think, working with something that is deeply personal and, and kind of comes out of your own pain and experience is a, is a way to put meaning to it in a way, in many ways, to find what you're grateful for, for that experience and turn that into something good. Sandy, have you picked out your tree yet? Or is that, are you waiting for the forest to come online? <laughs> I will tell you that story. Um, I was, we were, we were performing a, a spreading ceremony in Point Arena. And after our ceremonies, we always leave uh, to give the family some private time. And uh, we had just announced Better Place Forest to the world. Uh, we, we were on the cover of the New York Times style section that morning. So that's a pretty surreal moment. You open it up and you're like, oh, that's, that's me. Not where I would have expected ever to ever be. Um, my mom would have been thrilled. Big, big style person. Uh, and, you know, it's this very surreal day with this very emotional, very difficult spreading ceremony for a young boy, um, but a beautiful ceremony. And I'm standing there and I know I have to pick my own tree because everyone always asks, where's your tree? And I was thinking, well, I, I don't know. And I hadn't really thought about it. And I'm looking at this big tree that I remembered from when we were in the forest the first time tagging the trees. And I was like, how is that tree not sold? And I have this look on my face. And Terry Heath, our, our managing forest steward in uh, Point Arena, our first forest steward ever, she looks at she goes, Sandy, is that your tree? And I look over and I go, you're very good at this, aren't you? That's kind of her job. And I see the tree. I'm like, yeah, I think it is. And I walk down and I, I put my hand on the tree for the first time. And it is difficult to explain that moment. It's very much, if you're familiar with the idea of a flow state, uh, I love to surf. It's like when you're in a wave and there's nothing in the world other than that wave in you. Um, you are just absolutely in the zone. The intensity of that moment as you touch your tree for the first time and you look around and you think, this is what forever looks like. And you hear the wind blowing through the leaves. Uh, you hear the water running through the creek right there. And you look at it and you realize, yeah, this is what forever looks like. Uh, and it's beautiful. Uh, that was a very special moment. And I never understood it until I picked my own tree. Uh, we'd had hundreds of families pick their own trees before me. Um, and then that was when I realized exactly what it is that we're doing. And that was a real change because mostly I thought about what we're doing is making death a little more beautiful. I did not realize that from that moment on, after you pick your tree, when you think about death, you will see your tree. And that is very comforting and very different than before. Before I saw blackness and an unknown and a hope of something after now I know for sure that there is that tree in that beautiful place in Mendocino, California. Mm, oh, I love that story. And it gives me goosebumps because I'm a tree person. I love trees and I've always felt connected to trees. And so now I absolutely know I have to go, I have to go visit these forests and, and find my tree. You do. Well, uh, you do. We'd love to have you in the forest and experience it. Um, it is really something special. Maybe we can do a podcast while you're in the forest. Oh, that would be, that would be, if that would be awesome. I would love that. Well, uh, Sandy, t just tell our listeners how to get in touch with better place forests and, uh, how they might learn more. Great. Well, Karen, again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a real honor to be on your podcast. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more about better place forests, you can find us at www.betterplaceforests.com. Uh, you can also find us uh, on Facebook at Better Place Forests, and we would love to come. There's lots of resources about how to learn, how to think ahead, uh, you know, and just think through what you want. And whether you whether Better Place Forests is the right fit for you or not, what I really encourage you to think through is talk with your family about what you want and maybe write it down. Uh, maybe use some of the tools that we have to communicate with your family about what you want, because it is so meaningful to them when you pass to know what it is that you wanted them to do in a way that they can use that knowledge to help get through their grief and feel connected to you for the rest of their lives. Well, thank you for that, Sandy. And um, I'm looking forward. I, I'm going to show up in one of your forests one day, hopefully 
before too long. And I mean, hopefully while I'm still alive, <laughs> I'll be showing up in your course. Traveling. We have them, we have them all over. So we'd love to, uh, they're, they're all special. And, you know, we're, we're starting to get a small number of customers who have made it a, made it a mission to, to visit all of our forests. Uh, so, you know, you're welcome anytime. Ah, I like that idea too. Well, thank you, Sandy, for taking time out today to talk with me. Aaron, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Sandy Gibson. As you heard me say, I have always felt a strong connection with trees and forests. And so the idea of being able to pick out a tree right now that my ashes or my remains might one day be able to nurture is very appealing to me. So I plan to take Sandy up on his invitation to visit one of their forests one day. That's that's on my bucket list of things I want to do. So uh, I hope that you'll check it out if this is of interest to you. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I did an interview on terramation or human composting and It's seriously possible to look into both of these possibilities to have your remains composted and to use the soil that is returned after the composting to put at the base of a tree. So I think that's a great idea. I also really appreciate the fact that Better Place Forests is encouraging people to make plans for the end of life and be prepared in advance and that they offer tools and resources for doing that. So that would be a great website to recommend to people. They can get information there for making their own end of life plans. So remember, I'll be back next week with a new interview, and I want to ask you if you enjoy this content to please recommend it to other people. You can share a single episode or you can show them how to subscribe or follow the podcast on the podcast app on their phone. I really appreciate that. And you can also help out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you happen to listen to podcasts because that improves the ranking of this show and makes it more available for people who are searching for this kind of information. So until we're together next week, remember, as I always say, we're here for love. So if you remember nothing else of anything I ever say, please remember that that's the most important thing you can do in life. Just focus on love and face your fear. Be ready for whatever happens next and love each and every moment of your very precious life. Bye-bye.